and on behalf of TU Law School, the National Energy Policy Institute, and particularly our headline spos sponsor, Chesapeake Energy Corporation, I welcome you to the fourth annual Chesapeake Lecture. The purpose of this lecture is to enhance our dialogue on energy law and policy by featuring prominent figures from the corporate, academic, and government sectors. And we are deeply, deeply grateful to Chesapeake Energy Corporation's support for this event. We are honored today to be joined by so many friends and supporters, and it would take all of our time available to recognize each and every one, but I'd like to take a moment to recognize a few. First, Henry Hood, Senior Vice President and General Counsel for Chesapeake Energy Corporation. We want to extend our deep, heartfelt thanks to Henry and to Chesapeake Energy Corporation, ultimately through hiring them as interns, attorneys, and landmen. We thank you very much. And we'd also like to recognize Arnold Bress of the University of Tulsa. Thank you very much for being here. And we'd like to thank all of you for coming from near and far to make this event so special. So today's lecture is a little different than our previous lectures, and it was born over a discussion uh, that Henry and I had at Oklahoma City's new and very attractive Whole Foods, which is right across from the Chesapeake campus. And we discussed the powerful nexus between law, regulation, science, and geology. And we decided that it would be really interesting to have a sort of point-counterpoint debate on the subject of uh, the natural gas renaissance in the United States. And so to moderate today's event, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Gary Ellison, the Vice Dean of the TU College of Law, and also the Director of our Sustainable Energy and Resources Law Program, which we call CERL. Gary is doing a wonderful job as Director, and we are very excited that in just a few days, we will have our first annual Board of Visitors meeting for our Energy Law Program, and we are pleased that Henry Hood has agreed to be one of the inaugural members. Gary is an alumnus of the TU College of Law. He's been a professor here for more than 30 years. His chief area of scholarship and teaching is energy and natural resources law. And most recently, he co-authored a study on state-based regulation of the electrical grid as part of a project sponsored by the National Energy Policy Institute and Resources for the Future. Please join me in welcoming Gary Ellison. And I will serve as moderator and follow their remarks by asking questions that either you or I have prepared. Our first speaker is Terry Engelder, a leading authority on the Marcellus natural gas shale play. 
Dr. Engler earned a bachelor's degree from Penn State University, a master's degree from Yale, and a PhD from Texas A&M, all in geology. In recognition of his work on gas shale, which led to the upending, into upending geopolitics of energy, he was named to Foreign Policy Magazine's 2011 list of top global thinkers, along with colleagues Gary Lash and the famous gas shale operator George Mitchell. Please enjoy, please joining me in welcoming Dr. Engelder. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here. Now, Dave and I sat at the Ambassador Hotel last night and uh, divided time up. We figured that you would give us 75 minutes. As a professor, I'm allowed to take 35 of that. I'm really going to struggle to shorten it down, and Dave will have the other. Dave promised 30, and that will give five minutes for questions here. And um, the, there should be some slides up here if you can put them up. Yeah, this is just to remind you you're at uh, University of Tulsa Law School. And I keep a record when I give talks like this, just to give you an indication of how important gas shales truly are. This is the 245th talk since I did a very famous calculation that then led to that honor with Foreign Policy Magazine. Now, you'll note that I have a cumulative attendance of 15,139. Some of you signed this notebook coming into the room. That's how I know that that number is reasonably accurate. All right, now in terms of a point counterpoint, let me point out that last summer I was the counterpoint in this Nature article entitled, Should Fracking Stop? And so I just want to let you know that I'm the counterpoint and David is the point right here. Counterpoint gets to go first. Anti-drillers think the counterpoint is always an industry shill. So we're going to see about that. How are industry shills treated? by the public. This is, this is book number 39 that you signed. In book number 36, in a debate that I had with uh, Tony and Graffi of Cornell, incidentally you'll see that the point was Tony and Graffi at Cornell. In that debate, in this book, someone signed greed equals death. And so that's how industry shills are treated. And I like to get this out of the way, largely because audiences often have some people that will take me out in the alley and, and, and uh, shoot me or accuse me of being Peter Sellers and Dr. Strangelove. What I find particularly annoying is everyone thinks I'm making a lot of money off of this. And what I want you to do is, is don't look at me. Look at people that work for some of the more famous gas companies in Oklahoma. Um, nevertheless. I do recommend this book entitled End of Country. It's all about gas shales and its effect on Pennsylvania. If you read page 175, the authority on the Marcellus is a man named Seamus McGraw, and he will assure you that one guy who never seemed to be in it for the money was Terry Engelder. That's me, incidentally. <laughs> all right, so let's get down to business. State of the Union, President Obama, this country needs an all-out all of the above strategy that develops every available energy source of America, every available source of American energy. So this is what the anti-drillers think. Anti-drillers think this, there is now clear evidence that President Obama has joined Professor Engelder forming a team of industry shills. So here we go. All right, now, you're well aware that the New York Times has published a famous series called Drilling Down. Ian Urbina is the author of that, and as recently as Sunday a week ago, he had this particular article in which he pointed out that one Terry Engelder was one of the more optimistic in terms of estimating resource, at least in the Marcellus. Well, that's great. The problem uh, here is, he says, Urbina says, that Engelder's estimate is three times as high as the most recent EIA estimate. And, well, we'll see about that. What you need to understand for the context of this particular statement is the, uh, the fact that, that Ian said found right in here. Energy officials now can uh, say can be found in the entire country. So what does found mean? We have to look a little bit at the history of energy supply. 
I draw your attention to the dashed line. If you look below the dashed line, those are three estimates for gas in place, starting with the bottom line, which is a 1982 Eastern Gas Shales project estimate for gas in place in the Appalachian Basin, slightly above 800 trillion cubic feet. I've circled the bar that represents my estimate for the amount of gas in the Marcellus at slightly less than 500 trillion cubic feet. I want you to notice here that, that in this New York Times article, it says more than 500 trillion cubic feet. You've got to get your facts straight when you write an article, but that's, that's never slowed anyone down. Um, so there's my estimate, which was an estimate of the gas based on an early set of production wells that had been released. Now, remember in the state of Pennsylvania, production data was held confidential for five years. So this proved to be a real trick to write that particular paper. All right, what's happened since then is that last summer, the USGS caused a big row. If you look at the top three bars there, the bar in blue was USGS's announcement last summer that, well, the Marcellus has only 84 trillion cubic feet. And of course, when this happens, my phone rings off the hook, as you can assume. And uh, I said, that's great, but look at what the EIA, EIA did in July. Now go down to the second from the top set of bars. The brown bar was EIA's estimate last summer of 410. And I said, great, this is a, uh, as good a peer review as I've ever received. Uh, however, the EIA, I told Urbina in the article to the New York Times, the EIA caved into USGS pressure. I'll explain that in a little bit here. But uh, while all this was going on in an email exchange that involved a CEO of one of America's leading gas producers, I won't name him, and MSNBC's John Kramer, um, the company man claimed that 750 trillion cubic feet could be extracted from the Marcellus. So we have a difference that's almost an order of magnitude between an optimistic energy position and a pessimistic USGS position. So Urbina goes on and, and, and writes, Mr. Engelder said last week that he stood by his estimates, citing assumptions that he believed remained reasonable. And he questioned whether federal officials were being too conservative. And then this is, this is the kicker right here. Ur Urbina emailed me just before writing this article and said, what do you think of this EIA announcement? And I detailed the calculations that I used, which he proceeded to ignore. Then down below it, I said, I don't know what EIA did, but uh, other than cave in to peer pressure from the USGS. So anti-drillers think, well, that's a double death pox on Engelder for putting down both the USGS and EIA in one fell swoop and doing it in the New York Times. So that's the state of affairs right now. Um, now what I want to do is I really do want to honor this, this desire for a debate. Let me just say that the Marcellus calculation that I did in 2009, which became reasonably famous, was based on a distribution of average ERUs per well for various counties. And you'll note that there are only about six counties up here that have a, uh, an average EUR of 4 billion cubic feet. But if you take just those six counties, maybe throw in the orange counties, what you have is a reserve that if you calculate even for a 10-year period of time or is on the order of 189 trillion cubic feet. That's just for a 10-year period of time, just for those counties in red and orange up there, just based on this 2009 oil and gas, uh, Fort Worth Basin Oil and Gas magazine article. So what did the USGS do? Well, they didn't look at this particular decline curve, which extends 40 years in time from the Appalachian Basin. Now, admittedly, these are vertical gas wells, but some of them have a tremendous history to them and indicate then a, uh, a, an ARPS uh, decline with an exponent that was a, is, a, is above one. In fact, is amazingly, it's above two. So there's a lot of confidence in, in a lot of this. So what did the USGS do? Now, just to cut to the chase on this, the USGS took a, an interior Marcellus assessment unit. This is roughly the area that I looked at 
Uh, this is the area of the assessment unit, the acres per cell. Now, the very interesting thing is they divided this too finely, or at least in my opinion, in terms of being conservative. If you want to cut down a resource assessment, what you do is you take the cells and divide them down and down and down. In effect is that 189 acres for one cell, in effect, cuts it down to one well bore. And the implication of that was that, let's say Chesapeake has a pad in Bradford County. Usually on the pads, they put down out six to eight wells. If they drill one well and show that they're going to produce four billion cubic feet in a lifetime, that does not apply to the adjacent cells on that same pad, but rather the adjacent cells are still subjected to USGS's very conservative uh, number up here. And let me jump right to that right here. I, one of the other things I should point out is that the USGS points out correctly that of its 149 acre cells, only 1% of them have been tested. 99% have not been tested. So this is what the tested cells look like in this very large USGS assessment area. And uh, in fact, the USGS also says even of those cells that are untested, we're going to assume that just 37% of them produce gas. And uh, to me, you look at an area like the Barnett where there is production in more than 80% of the acreage. Now, admittedly, not all of the cells produce the same amount of gas, but nevertheless, 37% is too conservative. If you double that, then you take the EIA number that came out recently at 141 for the Marcellus, and you go ahead and double that. The uh, EIA, again, used this USGS number to arrive at an assessment for the American gas shale play, and they said, we're going to cut our reserves from roughly 800 trillion to 400 trillion. All right, well, if you give me double that potential for reserves, and then you're back up to the US, the, the EIA, 800 trillion cubic feet. And I've just been told that I've run out of time now. So um, the punch, basically the punchline here, is, I know, I know, but I do want to save time for debate. So uh, the punchline here really is that uh, I stand by what I said and by what the New York Times printed and by what the anti-drillers have wished a double death pox on me, which is that the feds right now are being too conservative. And uh, um, we at Penn State right now are organizing a, a closed shop um, meeting of the principals, which means the feds, um, Chesapeake will show up and a couple of the other operators including a couple majors, to actually hash this out because we can't have the New York Times giving the public the perception that the gas shale reserves are not what they really are, at least what we believe they are in America. Because in effect, the New York Times just immediately undercut President Obama's State of the Union address. We can't have that. Okay, thank you very much. Our next speaker is David Hughes. David is president of Global Sustainable Sustainability Research, Inc., which is a cons consulting group dedicated to research on energy and sustainability issues. He developed the National Coal Inventory to determine the availability and environmental constraints associated with Canada's coal resources. He was a team leader for unconventional gas on the Canadian Gas Potential Committee and in that role, he coordinated the recent publication of a comprehensive assessment of Canada's unconventional natural gas potential. A fellow of the Post Carbon Institute, he has recently authored two reports relevant to this discussion. One, will natural gas fuel America in the 21st century? And two, life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from shale gas compared to coal, an analysis of two conflicting studies. Please join me in welcoming David Hughes. Well, thanks very much, Gary. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. 
and thanks to NEPI and Chesapeake for making it possible. I'd like to first have a look at the big picture of gas and shale gas using some of the latest production data and the forecast from the EIA's latest annual energy outlook, which was published two weeks ago. And follow that up with a summary of, of some of the environmental issues with hydraulic fracturing. If you look at some of the optimistic statements on natural gas recently, we see from the Pickens plan, there's so much natural gas that there's enough available to, according to one researcher, displace half of the coal, burn, coal burning power plants in the US. We have the domestic natural gas necessary to fuel our trucks and fleet vehicles. Studies from prestigious energy firms and universities have affirmed the dream of clean, abundant, homegrown energy is now a reality with the help of shale gas. That's the uh, American National Gas Alliance. And this is from Aubrey McClendon in 2008. I believe US natural gas producers can increase supply by 5% per year for the next decade. And that assumes there's no more access to public lands and waters than there is today. And that statement was made when gas was at $12 an MCF. It's about $2.50 now. If we look at natural gas in the world, uh, it's basically tripled in consumption and production over the last four decades. Natural gas consumption went up 7% in 2010. If we look at the EIA's forecast from a couple weeks ago for the US, we can see that oil is, is number one, uh, natural gas is the number two source of energy. And their projection is for natural gas to grow by about 16% and maintain its market share going forward. So the, the biggest source of new energy in the US is renewables, but it's still only 9%, even if we grow it substantially by 2035. If we look at shale gas, uh, at one point it was heralded as a, a manufacturing process. Geology didn't matter. We could drill a well anywhere and produce uh, large volumes of gas. I think we're finding out a little differently as we get more knowledge about some of these deposits. If we look at the EIA's projection for gas supply in the US, we can see that uh, shale gas is forecast to grow by 365% over 2009 levels, so more than quadruple, uh, at which point it will be 49% of US gas supply. So without shale gas, all other sources of, of gas supply are going down, tight gas, coal bed methane, conventional gas, onshore uh, associated gas, and so forth. The EIA is, have, has been ever more optimistic about shale gas. This is four of its forecasts. 2009, 16% uh, in 2030. 2011, 45% in 2030. 2012, 49%. So shale gas is very important. If we look at that forecast of the EIA in terms of price, uh, the green line is their price forecast. They're suggesting less than $8 in MCF by even out to 2035. So essentially low, low prices uh, forever and rising production. If we look at the volatility of the past couple of decades in terms of natural gas price, the black being North America, we can see that uh, gas is priced at over $18 in MCF in Indonesia. Gas is priced at over $12 in MCF in Europe. So North America is at a very uh, unusual situation in terms of gas price. One of the more pessimistic voices on shale gas is, is Arthur Berman. Some statements from his uh, presentation in Washington in October 2010, shale plays are marginally commercial at best. The plays have consistently contracted to core areas that represent 10 to 20% of the resource that was originally claimed. The manufacturing model has failed. These are not low cost plays. The marginal production for most companies is 750 in MCF. And I've heard other statements that it's somewhere between 550 and, and $10, depending on the play. Reserves have been greatly overstated and 100% of booked reserves are undeveloped. If we look at the Barnett shale, perhaps the most well explored shale, we can see it has indeed retracted to 
core areas and, and, and other areas. And this is a statement again by Aubrey McLennan. There was a time when we were told that any of the 17 counties in the Barnett Shale would be just as good as any other county. We found out that there are about two and a half counties that you, where you really want to be. So as we acquire more data, uh, we find that geology does matter. And we come to the estimates of the Marcellus that, uh, that Terry just talked about. And in 2009, when, when Terry uh, made his famous uh, assessment, uh, there really wasn't a huge amount of production data from hor hor horizontally uh, multi wells that we, uh, we now have. Uh, and as we go down, one could argue that, uh, and the EIA would argue that we have much better information now, which is why it's retracted to 141 TCF for the Marcellus. This is the story of natural gas production in the US over the last couple of decades. Uh, the number of operating gas wells has doubled to about 500,000. The average productivity per gas well has declined by 36%. So more and more drilling uh, to maintain production. And that's what you see in this chart. Uh, natural gas production is a story about declines. Uh, this is production by well vintage. The overall decline rate in 2006 was about 32%. Uh, that's up from about 23% in 1999. So if we update that to 2012, this is ARC Financial, the overall decline rate is still 32%. So that means we have to replace 22 BCF a day just to keep production flat. Um, that costs a lot of money. Uh, ARC estimates 88 billion per year to develop 22 BCF a day of productive capacity. Uh, at 250 an MCF, which is today's price of gas, companies are short about 50 billion in terms of capital to be able to, uh, to meet that production target. And what, what that indicates is we're likely looking at higher prices, in my view, going forward, or, or declining supply. I looked at the the drilling statistics for gas over the last couple of, of decades, and we can see that there's a huge bubble, that black line, uh, in 2006 to 2008. The drilling has, has collapsed by about 50%, yet the highest gas production ever was recorded in October of 2011. And that almost seems too good to be true. How can drilling be down and gas production uh, keep on rising? I looked at oil well growth uh, as a possible answer to at least part of that question. And we can see that the number of oil wells has doubled since 2009. And some of that gas is probably coming from, uh, from wells that companies have switched basically to producing liquids, which is much more profitable than the actual dry gas. Shale gas production by play. You can see uh, just the, the stellar growth in shale gas production. The Haynesville uh, basically produced almost nothing in early 2009 and, and now is really responsible for most of the, the bubble in production. 30% of U.S. production is now from shale plays. So an astounding and very recent uh, development. If we look at it by play, uh, we can see that the Barnett the oldest play is, is plateauing to growing slightly. The Haynesville is now the biggest uh, source of shale gas in the country. If we look at the Marcellus, that green line, we can see it really, it really just got started when Terry made his, his famous 489 TCF estimate. And it's now up to about two and a half BCF a day. So we do have a lot more information about shale gas about from the Marcellus. If we look at the uses of gas, gas is a very useful commodity. 70% of it is used for non-electric uh, petro petrochemical feedstock, heating our houses, commercial. Uh, only 30% is used for electricity generation. If we look at electricity, uh, this is the EIA's forecast. They're suggesting a 50% growth in uh, the use of natural gas to produce electricity. So. Gas is going to take market share away from coal, but coal will still be by far the largest fuel source for generation 
through 2035 at least. If we look at renewables, if they more than double, uh, renewables will be 9%. So renewables are not going to replace natural gas or coal for electricity generation. If you look at a little, little closer at that renewable slice, uh, we can see things like wind uh, two and a half times by 2035, biomass uh, more than triple. If we increase so solar PV by, by 14 fold, it will still be less than 1% of US electricity generation. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, there's been a great deal of pushback by the general public and in state and national governments to environmental issues surrounding hydraulic fracking. Uh, <coughs> France has banned fracking. Uh, New York State and Maryland have moratoriums. Uh, and there's a moratorium in the province of Quebec in Canada. This is a, a report published by Riverkeeper in New York, basically summarizing a whole bunch of different case studies of alleged damage from hydraulic fracking in Pennsylvania uh, and across the West. So we have environmental organizations, community groups, listservs, documentary films such as Gasland, scientific reports and the New York Times drilling down series that Terry mentioned. So the, the mantra of natural gas as a clean transition fuel to a low carbon future is being seriously questioned by these groups. The main uh, issues are methane contamination of groundwater, disposal of produced fracture fluid contaminating groundwater and inducing in earthquakes, uh, industrial footprint, truck traffic, air emissions associated. Full cycle greenhouse gas emissions, which may be worse than coal. The Nature article that, uh, that Terry mentioned. One of the more recent studies on methane contamination has, has come out of Duke, uh, suggesting that thermogenic me methane has been detected in groundwater within a thousand meters of, of producing gas wells. If we look at, uh, you know, things like cement casing failures in, in gas wells, and this is not just hydraulic frac wells, this is all gas wells. This was a study done in Alberta for CO2 sequestration, and they suggested about one out of 20 gas wells has some, something wrong with the way it was engineered near surface. Contamination of groundwater from improper disposal of fracture fluids, there's several uh, case studies of this as well as induced earthquakes from injection of fracture fluids. And this has been demonstrated in, in Arkansas. If we look at the, the whole issue of emitted methane and shale gas being worse than coal, uh, one study by Howard et al. out of Cornell in April of last year, and, and this was another study to counter it by Timothy Scone from the National Energy Technology Laboratory, and I took Scone's data. Uh, he looked at the amount of methane from different uh, sources of gas. He used the Barnett shale for shale gas. And I normalized it to the EPA emissions for all gas sources in, in 2009, their 2009 inventory, which is the latest. If you have a certain amount of emissions from a gas well, it, it, the percentage of emissions d is dependent on the EUR of that well, how much uh, gas that well will ultimately produce. Scone said the average Barnett well is 3 BCF. Uh, the EIA's Intech report said 1.42, and Arthur Berman said somewhere between 0.84 and 1.24. So if you look at 1.24 compared to the Howarth uh, estimates on the right-hand side, it's within the range of the Howarth estimates in terms of emitted methane. To compare coal and gas, you really have to do it on an electricity basis. There's a huge argument about who's I mean, methane disperses quite quickly in the atmosphere okay. uh, compared to CO2. And, and so over the short term, it has a much more powerful impact than over the longer term. And this basically, if you look at the IPC, C 2007 20-year estimate is about 72 times CO2. The 100-year estimate of the IPCC is 25. So I 
just basically, if you look at the solid lines, that's the existing coal and gas fleet. And that basically tells you that out to about 20 years or maybe a bit longer, the existing gas fleet burning shale gas is slightly worse than coal. Over a hundred year time frame, uh, shale gas is, is clearly better than coal. Uh, and I'll just uh, wrap up at that point. It's clear that natural gas will be a very important component of U.S. energy supply going forward. Almost all eggs are in the shale gas basket as a hope of meeting supply growth projections at this point. There are significant geological, environmental, and economic challenges in continuing to grow shale gas supply. Personally, I expect significantly higher prices going forward over the next 24 to 36 months. The hope that shale gas can make more than modest inroads on oil for transport and coal for electricity is unwarranted, even if the EIA's supply projections can be met. Shale gas has been a game changer in that it, it has averted a terminal decline in supplies from conventional sources. A rational energy security strategy must emphasize demand side reductions in consumption as opposed to a supply side drill baby drill mindset. There's no free lunch. And I think Obama was right. We need an energy security policy that, that really looks at all of the above uh, very pragmatically. Thank you. Thank you for those enlightening remarks, and I will now ask a few questions. Some of them will be directed to both of you, and I think the first one would be, we see some dramatic estimate differences in how much is available uh, to us from the shale uh, hydraulic fracturing technologies, and uh, could you guys both address what you think the policy implications are if it's on the, on the lower end versus the higher end? Well, I think that it's very clear right now that there's enough natural gas even on the low end to uh, move forward in terms of developing an energy policy that's an end game. Now an end game involves the word sustainability. We really don't know what that is, but uh, at least momentarily the heat has been taken off. Um, you're well aware that, that I think that, that the low end is too conservative and uh, let's presume even the middle ground. Now, you'll note that, that uh, in that New York Times article, I was really pleased that Urbina did place me in the middle ground between industry and the feds. And even if that middle ground holds true, then that really allows uh, uh, enough time with enough energy available to make some major changes in, for example, our uh, electrical generation infrastructure. And I should point out, for example, that my sister, who is an engineer uh, working with one of the world's largest windmill companies, will say that wind energy is a supplement. Wind energy is not the end to all. And uh, the reason for that, of course, is wind doesn't blow all the time. You'll always need backup. And uh, um, of course, gas-fired generators that can be turned on and off very, very rapidly would be that backup. David? Well, I agree. It is clear that natural gas is going to be a very important part of the future. I just think that a lot of the hype that's out there about natural gas replacing heavy trucks, T. Boone, Pickens hype, uh, natural gas replacing a substantial amount of coal is overblown. I don't think we can grow production as much as we think we can in order to do that. Uh, obviously, it's going to be very important, and obviously, shale gas has to be a big part of it because there's no other there's no other choice going forward. But I, you know, I think it's a big mistake to look at silver bullets and to think that, uh, for example, coal won't continue to be a big part of the future too. So we have to look at at our portfolio of alternatives and you know very rationally look at that going forward. And I, I think a big part of a more secure energy future is, is energy conservation. It's basically figuring out how to optimize the use of the energy that we, we have as opposed to 
you know, business as usual, pedal to the metal, flat out going forward. Well then, speaking of this renewable future, uh, if we didn't have this large ass of natural gas, you know, even on the middle or lower estimates, what would our policies, should our policies be with respect to driving toward that renewable future and, and how should, are we behaving differently than that because we have uh, this new large, large ass of natural gas? Well, I think, you know, Terry made a good point. Uh, renewables are intermittent. Uh, things like wind uh, and solar and biomass electric or electric, they're not uh, dense liquid fuels that we use for transportation. Um, so, uh, you know, the bottom line is that, as Terry alluded to, renewables cannot be ramped up to get to anything close to our energy throughput at this point in time. They just don't have the intr intrinsic properties or the scale uh, to be able to do that. If we were to rely on renewables, uh, our energy throughput would have to drop dramatically, uh, probably 50, 60, 70 percent. And, and at that point, renewables could be a much larger proportion. Uh, the ultimate renewable backup technology for, for wind and, and solar that are intermittent, of course, is hydroelectric. Uh, but the U.S. has developed most of its hydroelectric capacity, so there's, there's not a huge amount of, of new capacity for that. And, and that leaves us with really single, single turb combustion turbine gas. Combustion turbine gas can be cycled very quickly and very effectively to match wind. And, it, and so it's a very important use for that. Combined cycle gas, which is much more efficient, really doesn't have the propensity to be cycled uh, as well. So, you know, natural gas has a huge role to play in, in making renewables work you know, a lot better. Now, if I can inject a little bit right in here, you'll notice I use the word sustainability rather than renewability. And the reason for that, of course, is we will always have the demand and use for plastics. Plastics come from one place and only one place, and it's drilling. Um, we will always have the need for fertilizers. And as far as I know, there's been no substitute for natural gas in producing fertilizers. So even if we can reduce the use of carbon uh, based fuels for transportation and for electrical generation, uh, these other uses will not go away. Now, in terms of a federal policy, let me put a little bit of a pitch in here for the absolute need for both state and federal funding of research, and this research largely is carried out by two or three large constituencies, one of which is university research, the other is federal research through branches such as the United States Geological Survey in the Department of Energy. Now the point that I can make is that I had the pleasure of sitting down with George Mitchell in the woodlands the week that the Gas Shale Time magazine came out. And he sat there and he said, you know, it really is a shame that people think that industry can go forward uh, on their own. In fact, is the development of Barnett was crucially dependent on experience in, with the Eastern Gas Shales project, which was a Jimmy Carter era project after IRTA had reconstituted itself into the Department of Energy. This is, is in fact, absolutely critical for everyone to realize the important role that um, funding agencies, largely using taxpayer monies, play in America moving forward, in making progress. And in fact is, uh, there's no gain without pain because that Eastern Gas Shales project was money spent in the 1970s. Half of the Americans that were alive in the, I, I'm sorry, half the population of the 1970s is not even alive now to watch that payout. And so these are long-term investments and um, they're not investments that are made to uh, achieve a quick fix. One last question about estimates. Um, those estimates obviously are based on geology. To what extent are they also based on price estimates? That's a good question, and it's very important to understand that language really matters here. If you go back and read the famous Fort Worth Basin Oil and Gas magazine estimate that I made, mine was an estimate 
based on very scanty production data of the technically recoverable resource. And I think that if you look very carefully at what the EIA has done recently, you'll find the term reserve in there. And when SEC calculates reserves, that of course has an economic factor in it. In other words, the famous Engelder calculation said let's not worry about what it costs to get the gas out of the ground, let's just think about what's there. And in fact is, by my view, in terms of thinking about long-term policy, you really center it on what's there and what can be taken out of the ground using present technology rather than what can be taken out of the ground to make a profit. Yeah, sure, the profits drive things, the profits are going to determine how many drill rigs are going at one time or another, but there's, it, it's, it's very important to make, to, to appreciate that this appearance that Americans, in terms of their estimate for gas reserves from gas shales, are all over the map. Well, they're, actually, they're not all over the map. If you start to factor in um, the economics of, of plays and uh, even apply it to my numbers, then you'll find that they're a little bit lower than 489 trillion cubic feet. Yeah, I agree. Of course, price is important. Um, you know, and I think shale gas, in terms of another uh, metric, which is net energy, uh, how much energy you invest in drilling the wells, connecting them, uh, producing the gas, compared to the energy you get from the gas itself. And personally, I think that some of the wells that have been drilled in the Barnett and the Haynesville have a, a very large net energy payback, the ones in the core areas. As price goes up and you spread into the more marginal parts of the deposit, you're spending the same amount of money to drill the wells and the same amount of energy, but the net energy payback becomes lower. And as soon as you hit break even on net energy, it doesn't matter what the price is. Uh, you're putting more energy into that gas than, uh, than you're, you're getting back. So that's, you know, that's the ultimate metric in terms of, of reserve analysis and resource analysis. Just to refer to another thing Terry said about fertilizers and, and petrochemical feedstocks and plastics, that is an irreplaceable use of gas that we really don't have any other commodity that can, that can do that for us. Um, for electricity, however, we have coal. And coal can be used in much uh, you know, less environmentally polluting ways than it's being used right now. The existing fleet is very inefficient. A lot of it's quite old. And therefore, I think that rather than looking at a, a wholesale replacement of coal by natural gas, which has many other valuable uses, we should look at, at coal itself, look at things like uh, combined heated power, ultra-supercritical plants, ways to make it you know, much more efficient as opposed to be replaced by natural gas to increase demand. Well, let's turn to some of the environmental issues. We had a list of environmental problems presented to us. Uh, to what degree has the natural gas industry itself taken up measures to prevent or mitigate some of these problems? Well, let me, first of all, offer that a lot of the very famous environmental activists come out of northeastern <coughs> Pennsylvania. And they come out of an area where there hasn't been the presence of a uh, hydrocarbon industry of any sort ever, as opposed to the area around Fort Worth, which of course had, had watched the state of Texas move forward for more than 100 years. People knew what to expect. Now on, on top of that, in the northeastern part of Pennsylvania, that part of the state was within commuting distance of New York City, so that you had a lot of people coming out of New York City, fairly well-to-do people, well-heeled we call them, who had summer homes in this particular area, and the last thing they wanted to do was they, w they didn't want this area industrialized in any, any way. And it turns out that, that some of the loudest voices are people that are not even natives, that don't have a stake per se in that particular land, but rather people who come out every third weekend. And um, as a consequence, we had a lot, of, uh, a, a, a lot of problems that were magnified as a consequence of the feedback between these 
anti-drillers, I call them. Notice I use the word anti-driller rather than environmentalist. There are two different, two different issues right in here. Um, I will have to say that, the, that there have been some issues that, that have come up. One of them, of course, is leakage of methane. And uh, uh, let me reflect both on the Marcellus <laughs> and on the Barnett. The Marcellus, particularly in northeastern Pennsylvania, where Chesapeake has a great position, that's an exhumed gas field. And what is an exhumed gas field? What it really means is that this Marcellus shale, which is a source rock, basically generated gas on the order of 250 million years ago. From that time forward, last 250 million years, it's actually been leaking gas very, very slowly. And what that gas does, because it's buoyant, obviously it tries to bubble to the surface. And every permeable porous sand layer between the Marcellus and the surface will catch and charge gas. And in fact, is what happened was one of the companies in the area got a bit anxious early on didn't realize the extent to which these upper sand layers had been charged and drilled down through them carelessly and allowed a situation in which more methane leaked into groundwater. Now, bear in mind it was there in the first place, but it, it exacerbated the, uh, the problem. And uh, the, the industry in that case really didn't fess up from the very beginning and say, we do have a problem, we're going to take care of this, but rather said, nah, that's not our doing. Um, and this, this, I think, industry has learned a great deal from that. Let me remind you, reflecting back on Texas, that, that even George Mitchell himself, when he owned the property in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, in the Fort Worth Basin, he spent many years playing the sands of the Atoka, layers of sand above the Barnett, that had actually been charged by the Barnett under the same set of circumstances. And in fact, is once he had depleted those sands, then he told his people, Let's try the Barnett. And uh, so, in a sense, that's an exhumed gas field as well, very much the same as the, um, as the um, Marcellus. Now, I've addressed just one environmental problem. Dave, would you like to try another one or two? There are a bunch of really famous ones, so. Yeah, I, I would say that I think that there's quite a few legitimate uh, case studies from Pennsylvania. There's also uh, legitimate case studies from the Barnett. The, the Duke study, for example, that was done in, in Pennsylvania, you know, the, the correlation was to active producing gas wells. And within a thousand meters of active producing gas wells, they had uh, hazardous emissions or hazardous amounts of, of methane in the groundwater. So that seems to be fairly clearly demonstrated that it's legitimate. Uh, if we look at things like improper disposal of, of fractured, produced fractured fluids. I think that there's been examples of that. Some of these have been mistakes. Uh, liners of, of frac fluid ponds that have leaked. Uh, you know, so that can be fixed. I mean, that's likely a, an engineering problem. And to a certain extent, the methane problem can be fixed as well. You know, my feeling is that the methane problem is really how you engineer the surface casing and the cementing jobs of those wells, and some of them fail. Uh, if we look at things like truck traffic and, and air emissions from compressors and so forth, I think those are legitimate. Uh, quite a, a bit of that comes from the Fort Worth uh, area in, in the Barnett. The whole issue of methane emissions and shale gas being worse than coal, I think, I think there's technologies around that can dramatically reduce the extracted methane and the vented methane. You know, whether it's through flaring or, or capturing it at the well, well site. And the, the GAO issued a report where they felt that the technology exists to reduce that by 40%. That would make a, a dramatic difference. Uh, I don't think that the whole issue of shale gas being worse than coal is gonna shut down shale gas for a minute. I mean, we need it. So we're going to have to look at best practices and you know, try to reduce the impacts as much as we can. Let and me just follow on uh, with th this particular discussion and uh, point out that, that methane leakage, of course, was, was public enemy number one, but public enemy number two was the Cheney loophole. 
And this again is another example where I think that, that industry at least initially made a huge mistake uh, allowing the service companies, Halliburton, Schlumberger, whoever puts together the cocktail that allows for hydraulic fracturing to not, uh, uh, to, to get away with saying, well, that's, that, that, that's proprietary. Industry, however, learns, and they learn very, very rapidly, I'm pleased to say, and within the last year or so, industry has put together a voluntary website called Frack Focus, and I point out in Pennsylvania that if you have a well drilled in your backyard right now, and if Chesapeake drills it, I mean, you get the API number, you put it into Frack Focus, and you will find out exactly what was put down your well in your backyard so that, that uh, um, industry is, is not monolithic. Industry, in fact, consists of people who um, themselves are uh, in, uh, conscious of, of the environmental footprint they make and, uh, by and large, work very hard to mitigate uh, these particular problems as they emerge. One of the big breakthroughs that happened in the Appalachian Basin relative to the Barnett, and the Barnett, the practice was you recovered frac fluid, you put it down disposal wells. And in Pennsylvania, there were no disposal wells, so industry started experimenting with reusing this frac fluid or recycling it in a closed loop system that will continue. And that's proved so successful that I think that the issue of disposing of frac fluid in deep disposal wells is going to go away, in at least in the Marcellus. And my bet is that that practice will get back down into Texas, where um, as well in, in the Barnett and the other shale plays, their fluid will be recycled, and it can be recycled uh, infinitely. So do you buy the uh, Duke study that suggests that shale gas is more environmentally hazardous than coal? That wasn't the Duke study. Um, that was the Cornell study, right. and the, the answer is no. David actually put the, uh, the key slide up just as he was finishing, and the understanding right here...